Good morning, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar on construction conditions in the 9th District. My name is Carmiana Matza, and I'm the Assistant Vice President of Regional Outreach and Public Programs at the Minneapolis Fed. I'll be turning it over to Ron Wirtz in just a moment, but first I'd like to let you know that today is part of a series of our Regional Economic Conditions webinars. I'll put a link to them in the chat if you'd like to catch up on previous webinars. And we'll be following up with each of you after today's webinar. We'll send you an email next week with a copy of Ron's slides, as well as a link to today's video. And we'll be offering you a survey at the closeout of this webinar so that we can get your feedback. Ron will have a moment for questions at the end of today's webinar. So if you do have questions as he is speaking, you can type those in the chat box and we'll pose those to him in a moment. And one final thing, our next webinar in our series is actually our large event. It's our annual Regional Economic Conditions Conference that's happening on January 14th. And I'll place a link in the chat box on Zoom to those who would be interested in registering for that. It will feature Minneapolis Fed President Neil Kashkari, along with Best Buy CEO Corey Berry, and panels on the worker experience and the unique challenges faced by women and minority owned businesses. And with that, I will turn it over to Ron. Thanks, Carmi, and good morning, everyone. Happy holidays, everyone. I appreciate you taking the time on a Friday morning to uh, to join us to for to listen to uh, just the latest results on our construction, our quarterly construction survey. I think I have some good news to share with everyone, as well as uh, I think what everyone in terms of uh, uh, attendees here, I'm sure you're familiar with some of the challenges that I'm also going to cover. But I think in general, uh, there's a, a nice outlook uh, among firms uh, in the ninth district among uh, construction firms. So before I get started, again, the views expressed here are those are mine and not necessarily those of the federal Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis or the Federal Reserve System. Before I get started, as I am, uh, want to do, because I'm really dependent on a lot of partners to get this survey um, administered. And so I just want to take a, mo a moment to say thank you to any partners that happen to be watching today. Um, I have partners across the 9th District that get this out to their construction members, and I want to say thank you. Uh, and any respondents that happen to be, that happen to have replied to the survey that are watching, I want to say thank you. You're really what make this possible, and we really pay an awful lot of attention to your responses individually, as well as your, your open-ended comments. They really provide a lot of color and a lot of insight to what we under, how we understand the, uh, the construction market and the economy overall. Um, this is the largest construction focus survey among the 12 district banks. I think that's notable and that's again, all, all due to you. So just a real big, real big thank you to everyone that's out there. So this construction survey was conducted a little bit over two, uh, two weeks ago in terms of starting closed last week. So this is real fresh information. We had 225 responses. Most of them are from Minnesota. So what I would say is that from a characterization standpoint, these definitely these responses really reflect what's happening in Minnesota. What I can say is uh, while I didn't get great responses outside of Minnesota, in looking at the results from other states, um, it was a small it's a small pool. I didn't really see anything that was notably different from a lot of the responses that I got from Minnesota. But again, because of, of a small sample, I'm not I can't really characterize what's happening outside of Minnesota well. These results are a snapshot. Again, as a reminder, this from a, this is more of a convenient sample. Um, and for that reason, this is not a scientifically sampled pool. Um, and I also want to note that in terms of uh, composition, uh, roughly 50% of respondents work in both residential and commercial, or at least the, I had more than 50% said they worked in those particular sectors and about 15% work in industrial and infrastructure obviously adds up to well more than 100% because you have firms that work in multiple sectors. Again, just I would ask, I'm also gonna offer some additional kind of new, new snapshots. Um, and I would just ask that you interpret these results pretty carefully. So here's some of my takeaways. Revenue trends overall are positive, and uh, they generally are similar to those reported in July. I would say a little bit more positive though. 
Um, especially, I'm going to give you a little bit more of a look over the course of the over the pandemic. Normally, I'm just giving you this survey's results. I think we're far enough along that I feel more comfortable with some of the patterns that we're seeing in terms of our uh, the long, the longitudinal data. So I'm going to give you some looks at that, and that tends to uh, offer a little bit more positive outlook as well. The subsector activity also seems to be evening out a little bit more uh, earlier in the year, where you're seeing a little bit more. Um, uh, top heavy from a residential, they were really kind of leading the pack. I'm starting to see that even out a little bit more. Um, residential maybe pulling, I don't want to see even pulling back necessarily. Um, other sectors, I think, coming up a little bit more. We are still seeing very persistent delays um, and that's that's obviously a problem. And we know that there are other challenges as well. Supply chain, labor constraints, high costs. Wages are also rising. That kind of sends a mixed signal that I'll talk a little bit about. Um, you know, good for firms, or I'm sorry, less good for firms, great for workers, but I think a good indication of demand. And the pipeline of new projects, I would say, seems to have plateaued. It is positive, um, it's especially at the in the private, uh, with regards to private projects. Overall, firms still seem to remain pretty optimistic. So if, as we get into the survey itself, our, the, our base question that we start off with is, is we ask, for firms to tell us about their recent revenue trends over the last three months compared to three different comparison periods. The top one is year over year. So the last three months compared to the same period a year ago. And then the middle one, quarter over quarter. So compared to the previous three month period. And then we ask them for an outlook. Um, what are your expectations for the coming three months compared to the same period last year? In general, you go to the top bar. I think we're seeing quite positive growth year over year. Um, th over the th last three months, still positive, but again, you're kind of moving into some seasonality issues potentially. In general, I think what we're also seeing in terms of the year over year trend is that I think some of it is, is related to the fact that we're seeing higher input costs. And so if you're building a house that was 200,000, let's say 300,000 is probably more accurate. And this year it's 350 or 375, you might have the same activity, but because of rising uh, material costs, I think we're seeing that influence a little bit what the revenue trend is year over year. But in general, also the, out, the outlook I think too is notable and that it's moderately upbeat. So here's where I mentioned earlier that I'm gonna offer a little bit of longitudinal data. So again, I need to repeat that this is a convenient sample. So we generally consider each survey to be kind of a snapshot rather than an exact comparison to the previous survey. However, we the methodology is still fairly consistent and we know and our, our composition of respondents seems to be fairly consistent. So what I've done here is offered what, what we call repeated cross sections for the same particular question. And I think this helps offer a little bit more, a little bit more detail and a little bit more context for where we are. And I think generally here, the, 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 the finding is pretty, pretty solid. We're seeing steadily improving revenue growth over time. Again, I think we do have to acknowledge that this also follows the rising, uh, the rising cost trend as well. So I think there's something at play here. And we also have to acknowledge that during the pandemic, it's been very difficult to get a good a good bearing on what the right comparison is. Um, during the pandemic, we typically we typically do year over year comparisons. That's without a pandemic. That's a lot easier to do comparisons that way. So we're still, I think, trying to find our footing on what the best comparisons are. But in general, I think this suggests that overall we're seeing a, a positive trend. This is the only chart that I'll offer that's not having to do with this survey, but I was really interested to see how, how that general trend uh, reflected into other data that I can kind of triangulate. This is from uh, Dodge Data and Analytics that we get on a monthly basis, and this kind of shows the same exact picture. We are, center, we are generally seeing growth overall. This is a 12-month rolling average because monthly figures tend to fluctuate fairly significantly. Um, so in doing the 12 month rolling average, you do see that things aren't growing. Have to also note again that that high that the higher spending figures that are shown here also um, are also um, in line with the fr frankly the higher input cost trend as well. So that's probably playing uh, a role here as well. But I don't think it's it's enough to say that we're not growing. I think that is the case. 
So to break it down, we also ask firms to get to tell us which sector they are uh, doing work in. And so there's a little breakdown here. And again, this is revenue trends over the last three months compared to a year ago. And what I'm seeing here is that, <clears throat> excuse me, generally speaking, we're seeing growth in all of the sectors. And I would say there's been a, a little bit of a rebalancing, uh, whereas residential was significantly um, higher in terms of growth. I would say they are coming back to the pack, maybe even a little bit uh, more so in, ter in terms of those that are seeing a little bit of a negative trend, but in general, these are all strongly positive. So then we also uh, just wanted to show what their expectations were coming up. And industrial here is the one that kind of falls back a little bit. I can't tell you exactly why that is. It wasn't clear to me in the responses why that might be the case. It is a small sample pool, but again, uh, just from just to offer the data, um, here's where the where their forecasts are for the coming three months generally positive overall and infrastructure in, in particular i should note was more upbeat than the august i have a feeling that might be uh the result of the infrastructure bill but again we didn't ask about the infrastructure bill so it's hard for me to say exactly why why they saw a better um a better outlook uh than compared to august <clears throat> so we also ask about cancellations and delays and here's roughly the same trend that we kind of saw in August, but we ask um, firms to tell us what project cancellations and days, delays look like from three months ago. So in this case, August. And um, firm cancellations are, are rising in the sense of, in terms of just taking the question at face value. Um, but I do think there's a longer trend that might offer some context and I'll get to that in a second. The other thing obviously is delays. Delays are a big and growing problem in general. So again, from a longitudinal standpoint, you have project cancellations on the on the left, and you know while from a net standpoint, they are saying that they're seeing more cancellations, they're seeing the trend in more cancellations rather than less. But it's also a little bit hard to interpret maybe how they are reading the question. The trend in general over time is actually improved while still being net negative, at least from a technical standpoint. I'll show you other things, um, you know, in terms of pipelines and things like that, that suggest that, you know, we kind of have to take this question maybe with a grain of salt. Um, the trend over time has generally been improving, even if it's not spectacular. Project delays, I think the trend there is pretty clear. We may be starting to slow down, but not, but we're still seeing it get worse. terms of by uh, cancellations and delays by sector. Um, we're seeing residential kind of stick out in both areas. Um, I, I think there are some, probably some reasons behind that. Um, I'd be happy to talk about maybe more in the, in the uh, Q and A area. Um, infrastructure, the, uh, uh, that area actually improved um, uh, over August. But in general, I would say, you know, again, we're seeing uh, project delays really influence every sector, maybe residential, just a little bit more. Cancellations also affecting all sectors. So we obviously ask also about the future pipeline. That's really one of the things that we're interested in because, you know, again, the reason we do this is we know construction is one of those bellwether sectors. If you invest, if you're, if you're investing in the future, that's a good signal for the market. And what we're seeing here is a fairly similar pattern from what we saw in, in August. Um, the public project still is in contraction level. Again, the longer term trend suggests some improvement in some ways. Private projects still modestly positive. Looking at both of those over time, both of them are moving, at least from those that are seeing contraction, we're seeing a, a, um, a roughly positive trend especially if you go back to October of last year. Um, more recently, I would say we're seeing a little bit more stasis, um, but in terms of private projects, we did see more say um, this time around that it was growing for them. So there is a, it was, it is more net positive from a private project standpoint right now. Uh, in terms of the different sectors, you know, I think, again, the, the, probably I put this in here more for anyone that wants to take a little bit closer look at it um, outside of this. In general, 
I would say it's a fairly level market across the different sectors. There's little variations, um, and, but none are really seeing anything more than modest growth. But I think all of them are seeing at least modest growth, um, especially in, in, the private, in the private projects as well. So I think everybody's familiar with the fact that this is not an easy industry. There are lots of challenges uh, going on right now. So we ask firms to identify the two biggest challenges to their current operating capacity and produ productivity. And you can see the answers there, um, the eight answers there. You know, and generally what I would say is this, the three that have, that have really risen to the top remain there. Um, material costs, uh, labor availability supply chain is really, I think, a very significant problem right now. What I would point out, though, is that COVID, while it's less of a direct concern, it is rising and it's still very much in the background. So the the number of respondents that said it is a great challenge, you know, the top two rose to, uh, doubled from 10% to 20%. And if you really think of it, you know, in terms of uh, its effect, it's affecting all of the other three. Um, and so I, I think we, we have to acknowledge that it might be a little bit more in the background, but it is really in the background, I think, right now. In terms of supply chains, this is the first time we asked anything about this particular area because we know it is such a big concern. I think I'll probably, um, I'll probably tweak this question. We're going to continue to ask about supply chains. And I think now we're, we're probably going to move to a question that whether or not things are getting better or worse. But we kind of wanted this first time out just to get an idea if there were particular products um, or particular market segments that were more, that were more um, clogged up than others. I think the general answer is product shortages kind of are all over the place. Um, roughly um, two thirds of, uh, if I go to 40%, roughly 80% of all of the products on here re meet a moderate or serious shortage uh, benchmark. Those, you know, again, you have appliances, windows and doors. I think a lot of housing products are really in, in short supply, but you really see it across the continuum. So I think there's a lot of products out there that are in short supply, including those that we didn't have on here. Um, a number of people mentioned things like, you know, simple products like paint and lighting fixtures. So I think the the general gist is, is that most firms are, are finding short supplies in lots of different products. Labor availability, we also know, is a big pro a big issue for a lot of firms, and it has been. And so what you can see here is that um, if you go back to the February survey, only 35% said labor conditions were very tight. And if you remember a chart I showed earlier, that's also when we saw we're seeing kind of the lowest spot in, the con in this construction survey. And things have picked up since then, and we've seen labor tighten very significantly since then. So you have the last three surveys there. And while the, while the uh, number said, while the number that have said things are very tight is dropped, I would call that mostly a wiggle that um, is probably not that important from a, a scientific survey standpoint. There's probably a margin of error. I think generally speaking, it kind of looks like we're near possibly near some kind of market ceiling. I don't know how much worse things could possibly get. You know, you essentially have nine out of 10 firms saying there's either moderate or very tight labor conditions out there. There's really not a, not, not a lot of room to go up in this case. Now, again, I hope next the next survey, this doesn't go to 100% for the, for the benefit of everybody watching today. We do know part of the reason there's there is labor availability problems is that there's a lot of there's a lot of labor demand and that's a good thing and that's the thing I think we have to remember in terms of having some of these problems they're undergirded by positive uh, by positive factors so the fact that firms are out there and still hiring I think is really good you know almost half are looking to add net staff over the coming six months that really is a is a strong market signal for the sector in general you're also seeing here that there are a lot of firms that are looking uh, especially if you look over the past three months there are um, roughly 25 percent or more that are simply hiring to replace turnover we know there have been lots of quits um and we know in general there's turnover so there's not you're not only just trying to to find workers to grow your firm you're trying to even just stay even if you happen to see uh staff loss again over time 
the general market signal here is they're looking for firms out there are looking for more and more labor. Um, so that's a strong labor. That's a strong sign to me that the revenue trend is not all inflation based, that there really is underlying demand. And that's a good signal. I would say it's also a sign that labor availability is a growing problem. If you look at the lighter green area, that's hiring to replace turnover only. That's been growing significantly of late. For the most part, the only the only notable thing that I would offer here is that there really isn't much difference uh, on net. Everybody's experiencing labor availability problems. It is a little bit different. Um, it actually eased a little bit in the residential sector from the August survey, and commercial actually worsened all. Uh, Com the, excuse me, commercial worsened slightly from the August survey as well by a not by a not too I don't know it was moderately or slightly, um, but it did it did see it, uh, an increase. Wages are also rising, not surprising given the given strong labor demand and lack of lab, uh, availability. But I think it's really useful to kind of get a picture of it over time. It has been a very clear wage signal that firms, more firms are are offering wages. So if you go up to October, uh, there's roughly a little bit between uh, probably about 35% that offered no wage increase over the previous 12 months. That's almost, it's not down to zero, but it's less than 10% now. So more more firms are giving wages, more firms are giving bigger wages. You know, so roughly two thirds of firms gave raises of 3% or more. Uh, roughly a third gave raises, uh, excuse me, raises of 5% or more. We also know that material costs are high and still high. Um, vendor prices, so I break this down in two different. So we asked them about what their um, costs are to vendors or from vendors and then what's getting passed through to the final customer. And I break this down, uh, the chart on the left is compared to three months ago, chart on the right compared to one year ago. So we are still seeing recent price increases, um, but in general, uh, the annual rates are, as you would expect, higher. Um, I didn't see a lot of change from the previous, um, from the previous survey, but that also just suggests that the high conditions, high price conditions that we're in are still there. And we are seeing more wholesale um, increases getting passed on to the retail level as well. And I think I'm, pro I'm probably seeing a little bit more in the construction sector than what I'm seeing in surveys that are of the general business community. So we also ask what the general effects are of this. And uh, this is fairly similar to August as well. Just basically the, the, the takeaway is it's really having big impacts, not only on timeline project timelines, but it's really having an effect on firm pro profits. And I think more, most uh, concerning is that I think firms out there really think those high prices and the supply chain problems are having a dampening effect on overall project demand. Now it's not Maybe we'd be seeing those pipelines be a lot, stuffed a lot more full. It's hard to say exactly what that means, but firms out there see it really having a dampening effect. Despite all of these things, all of these chan uh, all of these challenges, I'm continually impressed at just the resiliency and the optimism of the of the industry. Um, so we're see despite the fact that there is still what I would call a fairly modest pipeline for new projects, firms and all the challenges, firms are still optimistic overall. In fact, they, again, they, it improved modestly from the August survey as well. And if you go over to the right chart, there's a, a net positive outlook among all of the sectors as well. So a quick wrap up and Carmi, if it's okay, I, I might run just a little bit in to what the Q&A period is. So if there happens to be a lot of questions, I'm happy to stay a little bit past 9.30 as well. And if folks have to get going, understand that as well. So my, a quick wrap up, again, revenue trends are positive, both I think in the short term and the longer term. Longer term ha has a little bit of complication in terms of really seeing exactly what's going on because um, we're in a pandemic. So some of it's hard to, to necessarily square, but how I read it is that both the short and the long-term trends are pretty positive. I think higher costs are driving some of the higher revenue trends, but in general, I think I see stability despite these big challenges and despite the fact that we're seeing a lot of delays. To me, there really is underlying demand that, that suggests the sector is fairly healthy. 
And I think if we can address some of the challenges in supply chains and prices, uh, I really see there being uh, the potential for significantly better growth. Um, you know, to me, how I read it is, uh, you know, the future projects pipeline um, isn't necessarily, you know, over the top right now. But if you look at other signals like the, the trend for um, uh, RFPs over time, if you look at labor demand, if you look at wage growth, those also suggest that there's good underlying demand. I think in a lot of ways, if in terms of addressing the supply chain and price issue, I think COVID and Delta and now uh, Omicron, Omicron is going to have to really, is really going to be a big factor um, uh, going forward. If we can't, if we can't keep a lid on infection rates, I think you're going to see those problems in supply chains and prices probably hold um, because we're not addressing kind of the fun, some of the fundamental reasons why they've why they've cropped up in the first place. In general though, firms still optimistic. And again, I just wanna give a shout out to all the firms that are listening out there. Um, it, it, this is a tough market and the fact that you can remain optimistic and you're, and you're still profitable, I think is just a signal that, um, you know, there's just a lot of really um, talented firms out there that are resilient and I you know, wanna wish you luck going forward. I think one of the things that is also part of this optimism, I think, I can't, we didn't ask about it, but the fact that there's a federal infrastructure bill that's just been passed, I think that's gonna also lead to an eventual bo boost in demand as well. So I think that's probably a good indicator uh, as well going forward. That is the end of my formal remarks. Again, I want to say thanks and good luck to everyone for the remainder of the year and into 2020. And if there are any, or 2022, if there are any questions, I'd love to tackle them now. Ron, can you elaborate a little bit more on the supply chain problems? What's behind that? Is is that still driven yeah. by the the port backups or? Well, it, it's kind of all. I hate to say it's all of the above, but it, you know, if you think about supply chains, there there are. It's not one big supply chain. It's many, many, many different supply chains that have varying degrees of overlap. They come from a lot of different sources. You know, you have, you have, you have labor issues both at the production, uh, at the production standpoint, and at the delivery. So if you don't have enough to make a particular product, um, that's a problem. Then as it as we get into the delivery, we know we're we're in a shortage of drivers. So there are really lots of potential bottlenecks. And if as anyone that's ever driven the freeway before knows, you know one bottleneck can just lead into the next bottleneck. You know there are also other factors involved too that have nothing to do with labor. Um, a couple of people mentioned um, that they happen to get supplies from a lot of southern. Uh, southern producers, and they noted that the weather, the severe weather events that they had last year are still kind of rolling in to, to the supply chain now. So the part of the problem is once these supply chains are frayed, we haven't been able, we haven't had the time um, and with, with COVID and some other factors for them to repair themselves. So they just tend to kind of bleed into um, others. So it, it's a complicated matter. Um, uh, we're, we're hoping that as you know things move forward, they get repaired, but it's really hard to say. I think if you were to go back six months ago, I think we expected to be in a different position we are now. I think we still expect in six months for some of these things to get to be improved. Just hard to say whether or not that's actually gonna happen. Thank you. There is a question in the chat box about your outlook on employment for this sector. And in particular, some questions about demographics, the mm -hmm. demographics of the pool of applicants that are out there and how that impacts the employment outcome. Well, I, I guess I don't know exactly maybe what the questioner is asking, but let me take a crack at it. Um, what I think it. What I think the question is asking is, are you hoping to hire more people? And the answer there is yes. Now, it, what we don't ask is, do you expect to be able to fill them with qualified individuals? I think the answer there would be a little bit, a little bit softer. We know that the industry in general is facing a big labor shortage from an age standpoint. We know that there are lots of uh, people near the retirement age, the average age in a lot of these sector, in a lot of the uh, businesses in these different uh, subsectors is old. Um, and we don't necessarily see the pipeline of new workers coming in lots and lots of comments relating to workforce about there not being any skilled labor out there and that the people that may be interested in coming into the sector have very, very low skills from a construction, from a skilled trade standpoint. It, it's going to be something that is going to, I think, linger with the industry for for some time until we start um, our, until we're able, frankly, 
to uh, convince more young people or young people to enter or for those that may be looking for a pay increase to start thinking about a different career in this. That's a very long-term issue, something that frankly the industry has known about for a long time and has been working on well before the pandemic. Just so happens that the pandemic has made that problem worse. Thank you. And we've got one last question you had mentioned in your previous slide about the infrastructure bill and have, yep. that having a positive impact on this sector. Mm -hmm. Do you think, though, that that will contribute to those supply chain issues you were just talking well, about? Yeah, it, without a doubt, it, it could. See, what I, how I look at it right now is it's in general, it's a positive thing. There's going to be spending in the sector. Now, could it exacerbate some of the problems that we are seeing? Yes. The good news is that that money is not getting injected right now. It's going to take time for the federal government to send that money to the states and the states will have to take time to figure out where that money is going to go. So we do have, I don't know exactly what the window is in terms of the money actually getting to the let stage of projects. I see that being six to 12 months and you know potentially much longer in that. So the hope is that some of these supply chain and pricing issues can get fixed at least or at least moderated so when that money comes up we don't start we just don't go back into the soup again with regards to some of the problems that we're having i think again any any additional demand i don't think we should um i think that's a good thing i think we should think of it as a good thing because i think there are a lot of infrastructure needs so i i, I don't think the spending is a bad thing it it may not be as positive as, as we hope if we don't get some of these problems figured out before that money comes into the system Great. Thank you, Ron. And thanks to everyone for joining us today. We'd appreciate it if you would take a moment to fill out the survey that pops up as you close this webinar window. And we'd love to see you at our upcoming Regional Economic Conditions Conference on January 14th. There's a link in the chat box to register for that event. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a great day.